Welcome to the History Nerds United podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Huge episode for me this week, The Infernal Machine by Stephen Johnson. I absolutely love this book. It's going to be one of the best of 2024, guaranteed. Yes, I said that last week. It's true this week, too. This book has everything in it. You've got true crime. You've got science. You've got political theory. Every other book that I would have read like that, I would have said, there's too much going on. It doesn't all come together. In this book, it actually does, and Stephen does an amazing job. You're going to hear him. He's one of those guys, he's interested in everything, and he digs into whatever he gets interested in, and somehow it became this book. He's also got a great vibe. I'm just going to say it. You're going to hear him. You're going to be like, that's a friendly guy. He's interested in stuff. This is a guy I want to hang out with, have a few beers with. Let me tell you, talk to him for an hour, totally agree. I'm with you on that. So instead of listening to me, let's go talk to him. And here we are with author Stephen Johnson, The Infernal Machine, A True Story of Dynamite, Terror, and the Rise of the Modern Detective. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, what a treat. Thank you for having me. Listen, I have to say this because I have to ask this. You are one of the hardest authors to research because I read your (laughs) previous book, Enemy of All Mankind, started to look you up. And as soon as I hit Google, I don't know if you know that Stephen Johnson is a – just a pretty popular name anyway. You're right. But then I'm looking and I'm like, AI, how do we live longer? This can't be the pirate book guy, but it is. <laughs> is it easier for me to ask you what you're not interested in than what you are interested in? Yeah, there have been a lot of different things. I mean, years ago, a couple of friends of mine were trying to write a screenplay and they they had a kind of a joke character that was loosely based on me that appeared, this never got made, but it was their screenplay. And the joke was, whatever was discussed, that character would say, that's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was my persona. So I don't know. Yeah, it, uh, it's been like a great luxury of my career to be able to write, you know, I wrote books about cholera, I wrote books about video games, I wrote a book about neuroscience and about pirates like Enemy of All Mankind and, you know, now Anarchists and Dynamite, which we'll talk about. But the cost of that is, you know, there's kind of an eclectic quality, both to the topics of the books, but also really the way that they've been written, like the format. Some of them are narrative history books like Infernal Machine or Enemy. Some of them are more kind of science survey books. Some of them are more of a polemic. And I like that variation. Like that has intellectually been incredibly energizing and it keeps everything fresh because you're trying different genres. I think it can sometimes be a little mystifying for your readers who kind of want a certain kind of book. They read If they read Enemy of All Mankind they, and they like a kind of multi-threaded narrative history and then they, read some, they go to read something else and they realize it's a completely different type of book, that can be a little bit confusing, I think, sometimes. But, you know, I, I've, I, it's been a very fun career for sure. Well, it also gives you a lot of crossover appeal. Uh, one of the reasons for history nerds is to get people who wouldn't necessarily like history to read history. Yeah. Your book, Ghost Map, did that. I, I've talked to a lot of people. They said, give me a book that you know I'm going to like. I said, well, Ghost Map is one that it's got crossover appeal. And what I run into a lot is, oh, I already read that one. And, <laughs> yeah. and again, yeah. I love it, but I also feel like Enemy of All Mankind, it it feels like it's sleeper to me. Like people will mention Ghost Map, but I'm like, don't, don't yeah. miss Enemy of All Mankind. I love that one. Yeah, well, that's very nice you say. I mean, interestingly, like Ghost Map is is the best selling book of all of my books, despite the fact that it is a book about intestinal disease <laughs> on some basic level. Like that's what it's about. It's about people dying of of massive diarrhea. That's the the plot. But nonetheless, somehow, it is the best selling of the bunch. Um, I don't know what the lesson of that is, but I did not make that a continuing theme of my other books. But Enemy, you know, yeah, Enemy is is a story with pirates at the center of it, so that, you know, there's an intrinsic appeal to that. And Enemy has done well, but the problem was it just came out in, you know, May of 2020. And so it was just like, we were just slammed with COVID. And so it was just very hard to, it's very hard to get the word out about it. So I appreciate you you, you doing your, your best effort. Um, and I couldn't tour for it. I couldn't do all the things that you really want to do with a book. And it wasn't particularly relevant to a global pandemic, um, a book about 17th century pirates. Um, so that was that was too bad. But it's got a nice little fan base, and hopefully it'll keep building over time. Well, I, listen, I'm ready to tell everybody about the Infernal Machine. Where'd you get the idea from it? What was kind of that seed that makes you said, this is my next book? It was a very long germination process for that seed. 
probably the longest in a way of any of them. Although Enemy also had an interesting germination process. So it's actually useful to take a step back and, and talk about Enemy to Infernal because they're related. So with Enemy, I had this idea for the architecture of the book way before I had the idea for the actual content. So I wanted to write a book where there was um, some event that happened that was ideally very short in time, you know, maybe seconds long. And you would start the book with that event, and then you would go back potentially hundreds of years to describe all the forces that led to that event. And then the, the event itself would happen again kind of in the middle of the book, and then you would spend the second half talking about all the downstream consequences of the event. It seemed like a really cool structure that I hadn't seen before. But I didn't know what the topic was. I didn't know what the contents were. I just had the shape of the book in my head. And I had that shape in my head for like four years. And then I thought, at some point I thought, oh, what if the event is a crime of some sort? You know, like that gives you something that happens very quickly, potentially, and reverberates in some interesting way. And so then it was like, that narrowed the search a little bit, and I eventually got to this crime that is committed by the pirate Henry Every in 1695. That's the center of that book. And I really had liked that, and I really had liked the way Enemy is technically a book about pirates, but it's also a book about the birth of capitalism, and it's a book about you know the East India Company and the world system and the decline of India from being one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and all these different themes, international law, all these themes are kind of developed in that book. And so I thought there was something good there in terms of having a, a very slight edge of true crime. It's not a classic true crime story, but just a little bit of that, because that's obviously a popular genre, but something that you could kind of like weave a broader set of themes around. Like that's what I was thinking about for this, whatever the next book was going to be. And a, a big theme in all of my work is, is innovation and the story of how new ideas come into the world, new scientific ideas, new political ideas. So that's something I've always written about. And so I started to think, maybe there's something about the early days of forensic science and, you know, kind of fingerprinting and biometrics and, you know, these kind of this idea that you could use science to solve crimes rather than just brute force. I thought maybe, maybe there's something there. And the other thing was, I was interested in writing a book about New York. I've lived in New York for most of my life. I've written way more about London for some bizarre, probably pretentious Anglophile reason that I've ever actually read, written about New York. And so I thought, you know, it'd be fun to write a New York book too. And so I started thinking about like early forensic science crime. And, and I found this figure of Joseph Rowe, who's a major member of the cast of The Infernal Machine. And he was a, uh, initially a kind of a beat cop at, at the NYPD around the turn, turn of the century. And he was the first member of the force who really brought over this idea from Europe of fingerprinting and using that as an identification system. And so I thought I could maybe write a book about Faroe and about some of his exploits. And so I did quite a bit of work on that. And it was just, it was just too small. Like it just wasn't quite, it was interesting. The history of the ideas were interesting. The, the crimes were kind of salacious and titillating and all that kind of stuff. But it didn't feel like a substantial book in that way. And so I, I, I kind of got a little stalled, actually, for about a year trying to figure out what to do with it. And then I started to find, in just going through the newspaper archives, I started to notice how many stories were about bombs going off in New York in this period. And, and you know, you just look at practically every other day's paper, it would be like, oh, a bomb was detonated at the Bronx courthouse, or oh, there was a bomb in Little Italy that went off. It was just like having lived in New York for what now almost, yeah, 30 years, 34 years, the idea of having a daily barrage of explosions, many of them like acts of terrorism, as part of the landscape of the city just seemed kind of shocking to me. So I started to think, where did that come from? And, and it turned out Faroe was involved in investigating those bombings and actually played a kind of critical role. So I had a hook through him. And the more I dove into the bombs, that led me to the anarchists. And then I was off to the races. And that's when I realized I, I had the book that I ended up writing. And that first string of this, which has just a lot of awesome history goodies, is the reason why late 1800s, early 1900s, these bombs become so ubiquitous is because dynamite comes into existence. Can you talk just a little bit about where does that come from? Because it comes from a name I think a lot of people know but don't realize he was basically a bomb maker. Um, how did that all come about? It turns out that the story of dynamite is actually this uh, an amazing example of unintended consequences in, in innovation. I mean, one of the, the most extreme ones in a way. 
Most people know of Alfred Nobel um, from the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, and, and the other ones. In a way, the, the Peace Prize was a kind of peace offering that he created at the end of his life to make up for all the carnage he had inadvertently released into the world through his invention of dynamite. So he'd gotten obsessed as a young man around the 1850s, 1860s with this newly discovered compound of nitroglycerin, which was you know, one of the most unstable and explosive substances known, known to man, um, and really the first real advance on... Uh, explosive power since the invention of gunpowder, which had been, you know, a thousand years before. But anybody who had messed with nitroglycerin at this point had decided to walk away from it because it was just too unstable. Like you could just shake a jar of it or a, a vial of it and it would blow up in your face. Or they um, already lost all their fingers and they couldn't work with it Or they anymore. lost all their fingers. They, yeah, they stopped investigating it because they were dead. But Nobel had this idea that if he could harness it, the opening chapter of the book is called The Controlled Explosion, right? Like if he, could, if he could control this explosion, trigger it on demand, trigger it in a safe way, and enable it to be portable without accidentally exploding, that he would have an enormously, literally powerful new, new material that would revolutionize engineering was basically the idea. Like he thought, okay, if you can create this explosive that's so much more effective than gunpowder, you would, you know, radically increase the the efficiency and the and the speed of all these projects that were happening. This is the you know, the beginnings of industrialization. So giant railroad networks are being built and tunnels are being carved through mountains and, you know, there're about to be skyscrapers built and there's all the, you know, the Brooklyn Bridge and the Panama Canal, all these things are happening around the world that require explosives. And so he spends all this time perfecting it. He, he, I mean, it's kind of a tragic story. It's a story of really an obsessive on some level because his, his younger brother actually dies in a nitroglycerin explosion accidentally in a lab that Alfred Nobel had created, which would have, most people might have just walked away at that point. But Nobel was like, no, I, I, can, I can make this work. Eventually, he does, and he, he, he creates this kind of fusion of these two materials, nitroglycerin and diatomite, that enable the nitroglycerin to be stable and detonated successfully. And it's a huge hit. It does exactly what he intended it to do. Um, it does revolutionize civil engineering all, all around the world. He becomes fantastically wealthy and one of the great kind of titans of industry. But it turns out the very same asymmetric power that it gives engineers, like a small band of people can now tunnel their way through a mountain without a lot of gear, turned out to give an equivalent power to political revolutionaries who suddenly could bomb a courthouse or a castle or a cafe with a stick of dynamite that was small and portable enough to be concealed inside their, you know, their jacket. And in a very literal way, Dynamite is the innovation that leads to this new innovation in political violence, which was what we now call terrorism, right? The idea that you would have these, you know, deliberately spectacular attacks that would disrupt ordinary life or attack, you know, wealthy titans of industry or political figures and do it to get news and coverage around the world now, united by telegraphs and, you know, all the communication systems of that period. That was a, a movement that really was made possible by dynamite. It ended up being this, you know, this kind of tragic secondary effect of what Nobel had invented. Your book is the first time that I felt like I got a handle around the political theory of anarchy. I think it's done by a lot of people. And I, we'll talk about whether or not it's, it's like good and the people within it are good people or not. But the actual theory, even myself, I've had to read books on this stuff, but I think most people would say anarchists, oh, they just want chaos. They don't care about anything else, just wants chaos. But it actually goes back to something very natural, and it grew out of what sounds like, just like any political theory, kind of grows out of something that seems pretty positive. Can you tell me a little bit more about where does anarchy as a political statement start? Yeah, it's. I think it's one of the, in a sense, the kind of hopefully successful tricks that the book plays on you as a reader that I think hopefully is not a bad trick, which is just the structure of it suggests, oh, there are these terrible anarchists, and this is a story of how we've got them. Like, there's a bunch of serial killers out there, and we want the police to go find them and, and shut them down. But then you read it, and it hopefully takes you in a little bit to the consciousness of some of these figures from this period and the context, right? Like, why they develop these ideas. It's a much more 
complicated set of circumstances and, and a more complicated vision of the world that I think, as, as you point out, has been largely lost in the word itself, which has kind of changed over time in part because of what the anarchists did. So the original like meaning of the word, it just means no rulers, right? It, it doesn't mean destructive chaos. It just means a, a world where there's no hierarchy, where there's nobody in command. The core ideas of it, I think the, the most kind of sympathetic ideas of it are the ones associated with people like Peter Kropotkin, who I think is probably the most sympathetic figure on the anarchist side in, in the book, who's a Russian, brilliant Russian scientist, polymath, and one of the founders of anarchist philosophy, he wrote a really a couple of fascinating books, my favorite of which is called Mutual Aid. And he had this idea that human beings basically, their kind of natural state was in these smaller more egalitarian communities that you know connect back to early primordial hunter-gatherer tribes and things like that. But in modern times, we're best embodied by the kind of the guild societies of what he calls the free cities of Renaissance Europe. It's a kind of Italian city-states and things like that. And he'd spent a lot of time in those communities. And when he was writing in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, a lot of those communities were still around. And so he was living in a world where there were, you know, the infernos of factories where life expectancy was being cut in half and where there was an astonishing amount of, like, you know, death and dismemberment just on the job. And these enormous modern lords were, were coming into the world in the form of people like Andrew Carnegie and John Rockefeller and, and all these figures who were making enormous sums of money at the cost of all these people who were working away in the coal mines and the factory floors. And he looked at all that and he said, this the world is going in the wrong direction here. And we've, we're losing this, this wonderful balance and equilibrium we had in these smaller villages. And they were capable of great artistry and science and all these wonderful things, of, you know, advancing society, but they didn't have factories and giant corporations or governments, right? The, the, the anarchists were very much opposed to big government as well as big capital. And I think that's a part of it, you know, as you were saying, that it's confusing to us because it doesn't fit anywhere on the modern political map. Right? They're as opposed to government as they are to corporations. They wanted to return life to, you know, as I say in the book, like 15th century Siena. You know, that's what they thought people should be living in. And you know, when you visit some of those places and you think about what that quality of life would have been like, where there is sophistication and there is art and there is culture and there is community and there's craft, it's a much more equal society, you know, on all these different levels. Like that's not a crazy vision. It certainly wasn't a crazy vision in 1895 when all of this change had happened so quickly, it was at least conceivable that maybe you could steer it in another direction. It had only been 30 or 40 years in the United States that we'd really seen industrialization take off. Why wasn't it possible to maybe steer the ship in another direction? That was the context of the anarchist movement in terms of their political values and, the, and their vision of the society they wanted to build. And then for this story, the two disciples of anarchy really come down to Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, which th this is where anarchy just kind of falls apart for me, right? Because it's like they were kind of the leaders of the philosophy that said no leaders. So they weren't in charge of anything, but if anything happened, everyone's going to run to them and say, well, did you do it? Do you support this? Can you talk about these two? I mean, especially approaching it from I've seen them written up in other places. And generally what I find is everybody goes too far one way or the other like you were talking about before, which is they're scum, forget this, or that they were misunderstood and they were forced into these situations. And I feel like you do a very good job of making them sympathetic without saying, like, it's OK to blow people up. Yeah, it was a very delicate line to walk with them. One of the things that was so exciting for me as an author with this book, which really differs from any of the other books I've ever written, is there's an enormous amount of actual dialogue in the book, particularly between Berkman and Goldman, because, in large part because Goldman wrote a wonderful autobiography, a voluminous autobiography, but also because there's so much reporting, like incredible, like the number of like articles that I relied on to write this book is just so. There's a lot of actual dialogue that comes from the news reporting, contemporaneous news reporting at the time. This book has like far more kind of intimate scenes where two characters are talking to each other, where I did not invent a single word of dialogue. It's all from you know the original sources. It gets you into this relationship, this lifelong relationship between these two emigres from from Russia. Um, who arrive in New York City still as teenagers, like as, you know, 19 year olds, 18 year olds, swept up in this kind of Lower East Side anarchist movement. And they end up 
staying together in one form or another for you know really the rest of their lives. And I won't give away too much of the ending in the book, but they they end up getting deported together. They're briefly, for a stretch of time, lovers, and then they live together platonically for a, a large number of their kind of subsequent years. So it's a fascinating relationship. And to your question about their values, it's very much fraught with this question of like the efficacy of political violence. And Berkman, who I think, be interested to hear what you say, I think he comes across as the less sympathetic of the two, pretty much remains convinced that, that political violence is necessary. And the argument is the capitalists are already committing all this political violence. The government is already committing all this political violence. You know, far more people are dying in factory fires and explosions than anybody is dying from terrorist acts. So they started it, basically. <laughs> Famously, there's a whole set piece in the book about Berkman as a very young man, shortly after coming to the United States, attempts to kill Frick, who is the deputy to Andrew Carnegie, and he ends up going to jail for a long time. So there, there's kind of violence at the beginning of their relationship. And then later in their career, basically, Goldman professes to drift away from that worldview. And it comes to think that the violence is ultimately not worth it. But at some crucial points, she seems to be not quite capable of renouncing it. And so it's a very complicated story about what her real attitude was, whereas Berkman's remained pretty staunchly and convinced that there was a use for terrorism in, in radical politics. I would say, and you'll pardon my French, they're both a-holes. There's no other way for me to say it. But I do agree with you that I feel like Goldman thought about things. Yeah. I think she, like Berkman, was a true believer but did start to kind of back away and say, how do we move forward from here? She was at least somewhat using critical thinking skills. Berkman, to me, is just kind of a child who learned something, and it is now the gospel. And I will twist myself into not saying I'm not wrong. Yeah. No matter what I said yesterday, yesterday it was A, today it's B, but both times I was absolutely right. That's kind of how I felt about them. Yeah. But again, the way you present it and the way that you discuss how anarchy fits into the systems, trying to pull the systems down, at least I kind of get where they're coming from. I don't yeah. agree with them, and I have a lot of problems with them, but I can at least sit there and say, okay, I know what you're thinking, even if I think it's kind of outlandish. And in a way, it's a story about how the movement got, in a sense, co-opted by the violence. And... You know, I, I do think there's a there's a riff at the end where I'm like, what imagine if Kropotkin had been the icon of left wing politics in the twentieth century instead of Marx. And the, the kind of radical left argument was we should live in small villages and artisanal society and we should get rid of these giant corporations and factories and all this kind of stuff and the big state. And that was the battle, rather than top down communism versus top down capitalism. And I don't know that would how that would have played out. We don't know. It would have been different. And, you know, arguably, maybe it would have been preferable. Like, it would have been interesting to have a decentralized system that was being kind of advocated for in the 20th century in the way that we didn't really get that argument to be made. But the main point here is that with this book, you have to, like, from a narrative point of view, if you're not somehow engaged with the anarchist side of the story, it would never work, right? You just have these kind of, like, just empty vessel villains that you'd just be like, oh, they're it's terrible people over there. And, you know, as soon as we can arrest them and deport them, the better. This way you get, you know, you get a much more kind of, I hope, nuanced view of all the forces that are converging in these critical years in, in the history of, you know, particularly in the history of New York. I don't want to get too far into this, but critical thinking skills can sometimes, especially when you're talking about politics, go away from people. Yeah. And my favorite example of historical irony is in this book, Tsar Alexander II is assassinated, right? He is a czar, so of course anarchists are going to be after him. He is assassinated, and it's darkly funny. He is by far to me the most liberal czar of all time. <laughs> yeah. He was trying to <laughs> move towards – precisely what the anarchists and anybody who was quote-unquote liberal thinking of that time, he was their guy, and they killed him. And then you just get, because anarchy doesn't have a spokesperson, it's, all right, well, who called for that? Well, nobody calls for it because nobody's in charge. They just kind of did it. Well, are the anarchists? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. And I think that's where, you know, historically you look back at <laughs> anarchists and it just, it doesn't make sense to someone who isn't reading a lot about this, 
and the way you're bringing it out in this book to be like, hey, it doesn't make sense when you're looking at it from, you know, a 10,000 foot view. You got to get a little bit deeper. You know, it's interesting about the assassination of Alexander II because I had initially just planned to kind of refer to it. It's a very important moment for Goldman and Berkman. It's an important moment in the history of terrorism. It's really the, it's the world's first suicide bomber kind of blows himself up next to Alexander II. To, so my thought was I would just, you know, kind of allude to it quickly in a couple of paragraphs because I'm off to telling the story about, you know, life in New York, really, in the early 20th century. And this takes place in 1881. But it's one of these cases where, like, the more I dug into the story, the more I realized I had to actually have a couple chapters on it for two, for two reasons. One is there is an insane, I mean, we, we don't need to get into the details of this, but there is an insane kind of preamble to this assassination attempt where they, the radicals, who were also called nihilists at that point, try to kill Alexander II like 10 times. And there are all these kind of Keystone Cops routines where they like they set the bomb under the, like, the bridge and then the guy oversleeps or they accidentally blow up the like fruit car instead of the car and the train that the czar is in and all these things. So there's this kind of insane sequence of just all the attempts on his life. And then the actual attempt that succeeds is very kind of gruesome and important historically. The other reason I wanted to dive into it a little bit more than I had initially planned is precisely what you're saying, which is it led to the exact opposite set of outcomes that the people who were assassinating or attempting to assassinate the Tsar had wanted, right? It ushered in the reign of Alexander III, who was incredibly repressive and and demolished all the kind of democratization plans. It was terrible for the Russian Jews. All these things that, you know, the anarchists have been fighting for got much worse because they had finally killed the Tsar. That really sets up the overarching narrative of the rest of the book, which is in this battle to create a decentralized state without, you know, top-down forms of authority, the anarchists actually end up creating what we now call like the surveillance state. They, they end up creating institutions like Interpol in Europe and the modern FBI, which in very clear ways emerged specifically in response to the threat posed by anarchism. Like this is not just that, they, well, they were part of the problem. Like they, they were like the, the initial conference that started Interpol, which is kind of the network of investigative agencies in Europe. Um, the first international investigative body. It was a conference in Rome in 1898 that was called like the Conference for Dealing with Anarchy. Like that's, that was literally the title of the conference. It was so paraphrased slightly, but anarchy was in the name. And in the events of Infernal Machine are very much about how that happens in the United States really during the teens. And so the Alexander II story is really just a kind of a preview of coming attractions of what happens when a certain attempt to bring about a new revolutionary state ends up triggering the exact opposite of what you were trying to bring about. Well, let's jump. You just kind of led right into it. What's the NYPD like around this time? Because I will say I come from a family of New York police officers, um, totally with them. But I should say the NYPD around this time, maybe not the best run organization in the world. Yeah, it did not have a lot of resemblance to anything we associate with a modern police force. Now, you know, it was it was tied in with Tammany Hall, so there was a lot of corruption. Uh, there was a lot of kind of blind eyes delivered to, or however, whatever one does with a blind eye, uh, to prostitution rings and gambling and a lot of kind of money being taken in on the side on those things. And crucially to this story, there was almost nothing resembling investigators, um, nothing resembling detectives. That there, you know, there were technically people on the force as late, you know, as early as the 1880s who were called detectives, but they had no real training in being a detective. They had no information science to help them. They had no forensic science to help them. And so the idea of a cop actually like solving a crime rather than you know beating a confession out of a suspect was just kind of unthinkable. The NYPD part of the story is a story about how institutions change, right? Like how, not just how an idea emerges, but like how does a slow-moving, long-standing institution that's bureaucratic and has a whole set of traditions, how does it get reinvented? And that is a story really, again, the anarchists are at the center of it, but it's driven by these really by these two figures, so there are a couple of interesting characters in the mix in addition to them. One of them is this guy, Joseph Ferro, who I mentioned earlier. And then the other one is this fascinating guy, you know, I think largely forgotten, named Arthur Hale Woods, who was a well-born Boston Brahmin, kind of a Roosevelt-style progressive, um, was actually a, a protege of Teddy Roosevelt's, kind of a reformer, a social reformer, a Harvard man who lived at the Harvard Club. 
And he gets this idea that you can reinvent policing using science and using these new techniques, using techniques like wiretapping and cultivating a culture of intellectual sophistication among the police and not just kind of physical force. He makes one kind of an initial attempt, gets appointed a deputy commissioner in 1907, and that goes disastrously wrong, reasons the readers can find out about when they read the book. But then he gets reappointed in 1914, which is really like this kind of the centerpiece of the book is this sequence between 1914 and 1919. And Woods leads the NYPD for three or four of those years and really revolutionizes it, introduces a whole host of, of innovations. And uh, it's the kind of the birth of the modern NYPD we know today. Which I don't want to dig too far into that because I love that sequence that I want everybody to go in. I want to jump back to Berkman and Goldman. I don't know how to tease this out, so I'll just ask it. When you read everything about them, when you're doing your research, at the end of it, do you look at them and say, these people are hypocrites? D do you think one's more of a hypocrite than the other? Because when it's all said and done, and again, you got to read the book just to get all the details to put it together yourself. But how did you feel at the end of it when you were wrapping this up? Well, in a way, Berkman is less of a hypocrite, I think, because he's true to his values. I think his values were wrong. I have far less sympathy to Berkman because I think he just holds to this idea that terrorism is an important part of the you know, anarchist agenda and it was the right thing to do, when in fact it seemed to me that it, one, was not an ethical thing to do, and two, it was as a strategy for effecting change in the world. It was disastrous. You know, they were kind of like wiped off. They were a major force in American politics for 20 or 30 years. And they just, through these series of actions that are detailed in the book, they basically just got wiped off the map and became effectively irrelevant for the rest of the 20th century. There are pockets of anarchism that show up in the 60s and a few other places. And there's some interesting figures intellectually in our world, like Noam Chomsky and David Graeber, the late David Graeber. But generally, it is not a mainstream political worldview. And I think it's a large part because of the decisions that they made back then. But at least Berkman stood by the values that he expressed, right? Goldman, who I am much more sympathetic to because she's just a fascinating person and she fought for a lot of other things in her life that, you know, kind of re reproductive freedom and things like that that were valuable. And she is a unique figure in that period as just this commanding presence as a woman in politics in that period of time, um, you know, kind of sexually liberated and kind of an amazing writer and speaker. Um, so there's a lot of things about her that are kind of compelling as a historical figure. But I agree that she, if you had to call one of them hypocrite, it's Goldman because she really seems to want to have like both sides of it with, with the question of violence, that she spends all this time saying, I do not support violent acts, I don't support this. And yet, again and again at all these various points, when it really comes down to it, she's unable to, to fully renounce it. And if she had, you got to remember that Gandhi is like inventing, you know, nonviolent protest at this point. And so it was an idea that was in the air. Like she could have taken all her movements and all of her skills and all of her followers and done what Gandhi did in India to the American radical movement. And, you know, that would be a different history. There are so many great characters in this book. If I could send you back in time and give you one hour to interview any one character, only one, I'm putting you on the spot, <laughs> who is it from this book? I mean, I probably Goldman or, or Kropotkin, but the wild card here is Owen Egan. So, so Owen Egan is this character. He's kind of like not a major character, but he's this fascinating guy. He was the chief bomb diffuser. He was actually a fireman, so technically he was the fire department, but he's, he works closely with the NYPD. And he, he worked as the seemingly the only bomb diffuser. It was, the Times once said that it was, it was the only city job that no one seemed to want other than Owen Egan. He, he worked from, for basically 25 years. And it, to, just to give you a sense, again, to just like imagine what life was like back then. During that period, he either successfully dismantled or surveyed the wreckage from 7,000 bombs. 7,000 bombs in 25 years. I mean, just do the math of like how, con just in New York City, just in New York City alone. So that like gives you a sense of just the day-to-day -day explosive violence that, you know, was life in the big city back then, which just is shocking. To imagine that in the age of social media. Like imagine that just like every other day, like someone's getting blown up and, you know, it's just down the street from you. So Egan, yeah, he worked this job and he lost a couple of fingers. <laughs> he lost a couple of fingers at, in two, two accidental explosions, but he did survive. And I think 
the stories that guy must have had to tell would have been amazing. And he, he's interviewed in a couple of places, so I have a little bit of color about his, you know, he shows up at the kind of press events after a major bombing and talks on the record a little bit, but I don't have anywhere near the kind of intimacy, you know, that I, that I feel like I have with Berkman and Goldman and to some extent with someone like Woods. So Egan would be pretty interesting to have a pint with. I was about to say, if the question was, who do you want to have a beer with? It's got to be Owen. It's got to be, yeah, 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 totally. totally. Now, something else that you do with, well, that you don't do with this book, and quite frankly, my personal opinion is I love when authors do this. There is a epilogue to this book where you go on a politics of today rant about how this attaches to this and this attaches to this. And like, first of all, again, I love it. I love tell me the history and then let me do the critical thinking once I close that book. And you mentioned it, uh, you know, a little bit in the prologue about how there are some correlations, but it's not something where you go on a diatribe at the end. Were you ever tempted to do something like that? Is that thing you have any interest in? Or are you kind of my thinking, which is just tell the history and let the history tell the story? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. It's interesting because there's a precedent for that in in Ghost Map. So Ghost Map tells a story about this investigation into cholera in 1854 and the solving of the mystery where cholera came from, which was a seminal moment in science and and the history of cities for all the reasons that book discusses. And I had always thought I would have an epilogue where I would talk about what it means today. And there was a moment when I re- when I was writing Ghost Map where I got to the kind of final line of the main part of the book where it's revealed that there's a pub in London named after Jon Snow, the main character. And as I wrote the line, I was like, oh, I think I just finished the book. Like, maybe I should, this is the perfect ending. Maybe I should just stop. And then I ultimately decided to write the epilogue. And as I was writing it, I was like, I know I'm going to elicit more criticism of this book in total number by writing this epilogue. Because some people will be like, why did Johnson have to go off and editorialize at the end? It was such a good story. I just wanted the story. But I felt that it was better... It was on aggregate a better book with that, even though I knew I was going to get more criticism, and that's exactly what happened. That you know, if 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 anybody has problems with Ghost Map, it's the conclusion generally. That's I would say that's a that's a good summary. But I you know still it's been a wonderful success in so many ways. So I'm glad I did it with this book. Yeah, it felt like a little heavy handed, right? Because you know they're just little points where you're kind of like you think it's crazy right now politically, like. Imagine what this would have been like going through, but I didn't feel like I needed to, you know, be too strong with that. I I allude to this idea of like what the 20th century might have looked like if anarchism had taken a different path, and that's in there a little bit. But the main reason I didn't do it is I probably won't give too much away, but the book had a natural narrative epilogue where this very kind of amazing thing happens in the last pages where you kind of think the story is over and you go somewhere. And it turns out a character you hadn't seen for a very long time kind of shows up at the last minute and you're reunited with this person who's been very important to the rest of the book. And that just felt too delicious. Once I realized I could do that, I was like, why would I possibly bore the reader with my theories about you know contemporary politics when I could dig this beautiful little surprise ending? And the poetry of that was just too powerful to, to mess with it. Well, I think you nailed it. And I got to ask you our last question for every author, right? There are misguided people who say history is boring. That was a class in school. I don't want to go back to it. If I sat one of those people in front of you and they said the infernal machine sounds like history, I'm not into it. Why should I read this book? What would you say to them? What I try to do with history is really kind of three things. I think history is boring when, you know, as the saying goes, it's one damn fact after another. When it's just, you know, this happened, then this happened, and this happened. And so there's a kind of textbook history that you read where you're just like memorizing what was the date that happened and that president was elected that date. And that is boring on some level. Like it's useful facts to have. But to me, you know, one, they're interesting people, but to so that's a part of it, and particularly a part of this book. Like I think you are invested in these characters in a way that probably more than any other book that I've ever written. But what I really find so fascinating about history is like it's not just what happened, but why did it happen? Like what you know, what are the underlying forces that made this possible? Someone invents terrorism, and there's a wave of bombing that ends up creating the FBI. Why did it happen? Not just like what were the events, but like what were the underlying things? And so it's like, oh wait. That probably might not have happened had Nobel not invented dynamite or had this wave of terrorism not swept through Europe or had this forensic innovator not come up with the system of fingerprints that enabled people to create these identification bureaus to modernize the NYPD. So like you, hopefully if you read it, you get that feeling of not just like, there is a kind of a 
thriller structure to a lot of this. There's like undercover operations. There's, it is a page turner as much as really any book that I've ever written. But I hope that what you walk away from is not just a sense of like, oh, there's a great story here, but also like, oh, I think I understand the complex of uh, events and, and historical circumstances and trends, really, that led to this particular set of outcomes. And developing that skill to understand like why things happen, not just what happens, you know, that's, if you develop that skill through reading history, then you can apply that to your own moment in time. And it's, and it's just a valuable thing to have. And in addition to the kind of the narrative fun of, uh, of hopefully a book like Infernal Machine. Well, Stephen, I've already said it in my review that will go out right before this goes out. This is a book of the year for me. I already know that. We're only in May. So thank you so much for coming on to talk about it. What a treat. Thanks so much for having me. And that's it for this episode. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on The Infernal Machine. Trust me, people, it doesn't matter what you're into. It's in this book, and you're going to love it. Go out and get it. In the meantime, hit us up Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all those things. Hit us up. Leave us five stars for the podcast. Support us any way you can. We appreciate it. Until next time, nerds, stay cool. History Nerds United.